Leeds. Um, and now I'll hand it over to Sterling Spearn, who's CF Leeds' interim CEO. Thank you, Rachel. And let me welcome everybody. We're very excited. We've got more than 61 community foundations on the call and probably upwards of 70 people. Um, it's a great honor to have the Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Department of Education, Swati Adakar, as our guest speaker. Um, I had a chance to meet with Swati a few, year, few weeks ago and I'm very excited to see what the Department of Education is doing in early learning. Um, many of us veterans of early childhood, you know, drank the Kool-Aid in 1994 when the Carnegie Corporation put out their starting points report about the quiet crisis. Uh, at that point, the, the issue was framed as strictly a zero to three issue. Um, and of course, zero to three, which existed by another name, then came out with their website in 1996. Um, Back at my community foundation, at the Peninsula Community Foundation, we started the Peninsula Partnership for Children, Youth, and Families and adopted a zero to eight framework because we felt the first five years before school were as important as the first four years in school. So I was really excited with Swati's kind of framing of this issue and this, this sturdy bridge of kindergarten. And of course, we have pre-K now, and some people here in Washington, D.C., we have pre-pre-K, universal. Um, so excited that at least five people expressed interest in sharing their work in early childhood, and we'll we'll get to that, and at least five of you, and maybe more at the end. But let me turn it over to Swati. And one, it's great to have a practitioner. You know, Swati, uh, you know, was co-founder, uh, president of the Children's Institute of Oregon for 15 years, and she's been a practitioner. So it's so great when somebody in Washington D.C. comes from the field uh, and really understands what it takes to make policy become practice. So with that, let me turn it over to Swati, and I can't thank you enough for joining us, Swati. Thank you so much, Sterling, for that warm welcome and to Melody and Rachel for all your super organizing to make this possible and to CF Leads for the invitation to join you all today. I'm most appreciative also, Sterling, for your offer to moderate the conversation today and as you referenced your longstanding support of early learning, including being the founder and major funder of Raising a Reader. Um, where I had a chance to meet you in person while leading a community foundation. So just a great example. I'm sorry that my colleague, um, Sheetal Shah, isn't able to join us today um, in her role as a senior advisor, as strategic partnership. She's been a wonderful partner for me in helping to um, have the department reanimate those key philanthropic uh, relationships that are so key to this pu public-private kind of partnership work that makes such a difference. Um, and given she's not here today, um, I know she'd want me to emphasize a few things. So um, on her behalf, first, we really hope to learn with you and from you. And we know we can benefit from your access to experts and your expertise. And thirdly, we're really eager to work with you to elevate, amplify, and extend the reach of our message um, across your grantee networks. I'm so pleased also um, that today's agenda allows us to hear directly from a few of you on the early learning work taking place um, in your respective states and regions. And delighted to have the chance to share with you the department's early learning agenda today so I can get your thoughts, input and advice on how best to seize this opportunity and think about together of how we can advance this work. The work I helped lead in Oregon that Sterling referenced while I was president and CEO of the Children's Institute um, was really fueled by philanthropic support. So I know firsthand how pivotal the support and partnership of local and regional community foundations can be in not only moving the work forward, but really being part of the key strategy as to how that work um, is, is more than seeds planted, but how it becomes sustainable. So I thank you all for that incredible role you play. I realize that a few of you may have heard this presentation before if you joined one of the February philanthropic briefings 
or by chance if you um, have had a chance to tune in to the fantastic and transforming kindergarten webinar series that has been put together and sponsored by um, the Campaign for Grade Level Reading and New America. We've been really pleased that they've been on this journey with us to elevate this work. I think I, well, I see Miriam Shark there on my screen um, here from the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. And it would be wonderful, Miriam, if you were able to drop that link in the chat that can share more information. Um, it's just about a year ago, actually, that I had the chance to take what I've learned at the state and local level and join the Biden-Harris administration team. Um, joining halfway through this term. And so um, I always remind people as a political appointee, I'm on a short runway. Luckily, there's some amazing leaders on whose shoulders that I am able to stand when I stepped into this role. Many of these names are probably familiar to you, Jacqueline Jones, Libby Doggett, Miriam Calderon, who all served before me and helped to shape a foundation upon which we can build. Uh, the legendary Barbara Bowman has reminded us on many an occasion that the developmental span of early childhood begins at birth and it goes through the early elementary grades through third grade. That is why the Department of Education collaborates so closely with our sister agency, HHS, Health and Human Services, particularly on um, that early development and learning. Um, a couple examples of how we collaborate on that work um, is the preschool development grant. I'm guessing some of you are familiar with that. In addition to supporting young children, um, beginning with infants and toddlers uh, to support children with learning disabilities, delays and learning differences. You know, the department's leadership role and opportunity um, in early learning is really in the elementary grades from preschool through third grade. Um, and as I referenced that was birth to five years, which are of course foundational critical is a solid partnership with HHS where really the majority of the funding lies at the federal level. Um, I was delighted to be in the audience um, when Secretary Cardona um, gave his speech to launch the department's Raise the Bar initiative in January, when he supported the president's call for free universal early childhood education and encouraged school districts to use their Title I dollars to expand early learning and specifically high quality preschool and underscored the importance of that instructional alignment and continuity with the early grades and to uh, make sure we enhance kindergarten as the sturdy bridge. My longtime mentor, Dr. Ruby Takanishi, a leader in philanthropy for a long time, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with her and her work. She was actually the founding leader of the pre-K third movement. And she used to say, we need to reduce the chaos at the schoolhouse door. And what she meant by that was we need to build a more aligned system, a system that requires a sturdy bridge between the early years and the early grades. That bridge is kindergarten. In December, 2021, well before I arrived at the department, the secretary announced a commitment to the kindergarten year becoming a more effective path to early school success and academic recovery through a kindergarten collaborative. This collaborative has engaged 15 states and just concluded recently. And it's part of the initial phase of the department's pre-K third agenda, which is kindergarten centered, acknowledges the need to attend urgently to um, academic recovery and you know, rely and leverage the existing resources. We want it to be actionable, sustainable, and make sure we're bringing an equity lens as we think about how we promote early school success. Kindergarten presents a really unique opportunity to accelerate early learning, equity, and lay the path for early school success by meeting the developmental needs of every entering kindergartner. Let's imagine for a moment that we are all now kindergarten teachers. Maybe some of you have been a kindergarten teacher before. And we are preparing to receive and welcome young learners on their first day of kindergarten, and it's the beginning of a new school year. What you know is that kids are arriving from a really diverse array of settings. Some children are home with the parents, 
summer in family friend and neighbor child care, summer in a Head Start program, a preschool um, inclusion program, um, Head Start. We know not all of these experiences are the same kinds of experiences, and not all these experiences are of the same quality. We also know children um, arrive with a wide range of developmental strengths. It's typical for children to develop in different areas at different rates. Some have learning differences, developmental delays, or disabilities. They can also have uh, multiple physical and behavioral health challenges. And we know that many of those have not been detected or diagnosed or, and they can often then be untreated. Think about something as simple as vision screening. Kids can often get screened, but do they actually get those glasses? And those developmental supports are consequential. We work, we're working so hard in the birth to five space to build universal supports. But what really um, is something I don't think that we grasp fully is that kindergarten is often the first at scale early learning opportunity to provide supports and interventions to assure on track development for our most vulnerable students. And these vulnerable students, in fact, are the priority special populations that the department is most focused on low-income children, English language learners, kids with delays and disabilities, homeless children. Um, and it, you know, given this at scale opportunity and the opportunity to reach all children, seeing the current very high chronic absence rates in kindergarten is particularly troubling. This is even after we've returned to in-person instruction. And I'm really grateful to Attendance Works for the work they do to bring this attention to our issues along with the strategies that they lift up that can support um, districts and communities to attend to this. Kindergarten is that time where we're building and nurturing the adult relationships that are essential to ongoing family engagement and routines such as everyday attendance. I think many of us are very familiar with those opportunity and achievement gaps that are well entrenched by kindergarten. But I believe what is less well known is the widening gap that happens during the kindergarten year. And that gap persists through the early elementary grades. Kindergarten is an inflection point. We have an opportunity to equip kindergarten teachers with the tools and the information to meet students where they are and to do so at the beginning of their educational journey. This is gonna require an embrace of whole child development, social emotional learning, multilingual learning and playful learning, things that are really key to strong supports in the early years. Driving towards a more robust, effective, and equitable kindergarten is gonna require us to take up three tough and complicated challenges. The first, we've gotta transform two critical transitions, the transition into kindergarten and the transition from kindergarten to first grade so that we can inform developmentally appropriate practice in kindergarten and differentiated instruction in first grade. What we know is that transitions are fraught across the education continuum and they're particularly pernicious in those early years. Second, when we elevate developmentally appropriate practice, let's make sure that we bring an equity lens that attends to the unique developmental needs of individual children. Thirdly, we've got to hone in on those enabling conditions for success. These include intentional and systematic alignment for continuity, powerful models of instructional and assessment practice, professional development and supports, those important productive partnerships with parents, caregivers, and families, and the strategic blending and braiding of funding streams so we can work towards sustainability, alignment, collaboration, and equity. I have a feeling many of you will recognize these as the levers for system reform because many of you have been funding this, um, these levers for quite a long time. I wanted to briefly just share some of the strategies underway at the department and, and assure you that they're guided by knowledgeable leadership at the department from former educators, principals, superintendents, and state chiefs who are guiding our work. We want to support school districts um, and schools to leverage their federal, state, and local funding to expand access to preschool and other early learning opportunities. Um, through Title I funding and other funds to create those 
that instructional alignment and continuity pre-K through third grade. We're eager to continue um, support for states to learn from each other about effective transitions and how to support um, child development and form instructional practices. We're also eager to partner with you and other um, funders and folks in philanthropy um, and organizations who support and work directly with young learners, families, and communities to help us lift up bright spots across the country so we can inform our work. You all, as community foundations, are exceptionally well positioned to accelerate an important aspect of this kindergarten as a sturdy bridge strategy, the Bright Spots campaign. Community foundations have the local knowledge, a track record of local investing, and those trusted relationships, when combined, allow you to work with local educators and state and local affiliates of their of membership organizations to help lift up and find those early educators, classroom teachers, school leaders, district chiefs, who are there every day doing that hard work uh, through innovative programs and practices that is often unheard, unnoticed, unrecognized, and they deserve recognition as models, proof points, and sources of inspiration. As I said at the outset, I'm really looking forward to learning with you and from you and benefiting from your expertise and your experience. Thank you so much. Over to you, Sterling. Thank you, Swati. That's that's great. I'm I'm guessing we may take some questions from the audience if you use the raise hand function. Um, and we've also got at least five of our colleagues who would like to share some of their work at the local level. Um, are there any questions for Swati? And I appreciate all the resources in the chat that Miriam and Melody put in there, uh, other connections there. Any raised hands? Rachel, do you see any raised hands? Um, not right yet, not right now, but you can um, feel free to take yourself off of mute if you have a question for Swati. I can also um, want to thank our colleagues who, who uh, you know, volunteered to share some of their work and how that might connect to some of the um, the key initiatives that the Department of Education is promoting under Swati's leadership. Um, uh, Linda Yoder at Marshall County Community Foundation in Indiana. Linda, do you wanna do you wanna weigh in here? I'll go as people come off mute. Uh, uh, Jesse Gunn from Whitby Community Foundation, uh, way up in the Northwest. Jesse, you were on the list of people that might want to share some some of your work. Okay. People are shy or Jesse is on hiding. the call. Linda is not. Uh, how about Jackie Hinton from St. Clair County, my old my old home state of Michigan. No. No. Vanessa Bechtel from Ventura County. Vanessa is on. Hi, just good to good to see you. I, I wasn't actually sure if we were confirmed or not to share the story. So I will um, just share that we are in the midst of doing um, a pretty significant early childhood education initiative in uh, Ventura County um, called the Isabella Project and then the Ventura County Highest Quality Early Childhood Education Initiative. And the Isabella Project is actually named after a little girl who was born right when we kicked off the project. She's now about 16 months. We have 72 organizations, government, faith-based, uh, the school system, uh, child care, medical help, um, just because we understand it's not just about um, access to early childhood education. It has to be high quality. And then also the barriers to participating need to be removed. And that includes the whole child and the whole family. Um, what we've recognized is that over 50% of children in Ventura County don't have any access to early childhood education, despite the funding being there. And our county is actually missing $40 million that's in the state and federal budget this year for access. Um, and this is where it's just incredibly frustrating because Quite frankly, if the infrastructure was there, those dollars would be able to follow. And I think there was a lot of enthusiasm about the increased um, 
financial support available for early childhood education, but if you don't have the infrastructure, you can't access those dollars. And really what needs to happen is we need a major investment to support the infrastructure um, within the community, and then we can be able to um, effectively tap into those dollars. But in Santa Paula, which is our pilot program, um, two-thirds of children did not have any access to early childhood education, so it was higher than the rest of the county, um, but the community is just extremely strong. Um, it's just extremely strong in terms of community involvement and connection. Um, uh, and um, so far, we've had about 200 more spots added, and we're working, um, we secured a million and a half dollar grant um, where about 500,000 is going to actually go to a study to help remove the barriers. Not a study, but a um, strategy and a tactical approach to how we can collectively remove the barriers. And we're not advocating only one type of solution because we know different things are needed for different families. Um, but I, I just really see potential. Um, and what really um, I think would make the most profound difference, at least in California, um, is, um, is the infrastructure support to be able to, um, I mean, quite frankly, it's like the little booties and seats is how the money gets accessed. And if you don't have those little booties and feet, you can't access the money available. And so we have to have the infrastructure to be able to have the little booties and feet so we can get we can get access to the financial support. And what we um, what we did do is a comparison across the country. And we know Alabama um, has the highest level of um, early childhood education um, in the state in terms of the quality. And um, based on that, we know that 80% of the funding is, that is actually needed is in the state or federal budget, and over half of that we're not tapping into. Um, and so those are kind of my thoughts on, on, on what would be helpful, and then also just to share where we're at. We're all in. We are all in on early childhood education. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, I think uh, one challenge we all face is as we put an emphasis on the early years, um, how do we work with the K-12 system or the pre-K-12 system? Because as much as we invest in the first three or four years, um, some of the slides that Swati shared, you know, crossing the schoolhouse border, the doors into that world of school can, can set some families back or propel them forward. Um, and yet I know my own experience was, wow, it's so much easier to work with a more fragmented um modular early childhood world than the structured K-12 public school system. But obviously, if, if we can't figure out the articulation and continuity across that sturdy bridge, um, much of our work in the early years can be can be lost or not reach its full potential. Um, anybody, anybody working on that kindergarten transition from the early childhood years? Um, hold on. I can add my camera here. That's you, Sandy? That is me. Hold on. <laughs> Let me put it so you can actually see me. And where are you, Sandy? I'm in Central Florida. And I don't know why it's doing this. OK. Hold on one second. Sorry about that. Um, we're doing some work. We have a group, and I just put the, the link in the chat called the um, K-Ready Community. Right now, it's the research and some of the infrastructure is being funded by the Helios Foundation, but it's a collective impact effort to get kids in our community ready for kindergarten. And one of the things that we've found in, um, in all of this research and discussion is that there's you know, certain pillars that need to be in place. And we're using um, I've got to remember exactly what it is, but we're using a structure right now that's really about helping to create a strong family environment so that as kids go into kindergarten, they are in a safe and nurturing space. The other thing that we found is that in our early learning system here, we have a serious shortage of teachers. And you know, we're in Florida, so we have a serious shortage of teachers anyway, and there's a lot of things that are going on politically within our education system that are making things very challenging. But um, we're starting to put some dollars and emphasis into 
some pipeline creation to get um, kids from high school and um, and community college or state college to think about going into the early learning as a career and how to ladder that up because it's been one of those really big challenges. I think we have a 58% ready for kindergarten rate right now, and that's pretty low, I think. I don't know what it is nationally, but I know for us it's disappointing and we need to certainly get that number up. But this is a, a large group that's working on really hopefully making some changes around that. But I do agree that infrastructure funding is something that's really challenging. I think collective impact funding is challenging in general. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Candy, Candy Yoder from uh, Elkhart County Community Foundation. Candy, are you uh, are you on the line? I am on the line. I'm here. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, we're about 18 months into a uh, community conversation and launching an initiative. We're calling it Building Strong Brains. And we opted to, um, to really take a holistic approach and uh, believing that parents are the first and most important influence really starting there. We have a county that has uh, that is rich in resources and yet families don't know how to access them and we create gaps in the wonderful services we provide individually, gaps get created. I come from 30 years uh, from an organization providing social services and family supports. And I saw that despite our best efforts to do fabulous services, the needles at the population level were not changing. And so we have convened a collection of folks um, and we listened to parents first to hear what their concerns are and, and what their reality is. We've created action teams around three pillars. One is about maternal uh, health. So even things like, like nutrition and access to medical care early prenatal through those earliest years. Um, another pillar is about community supports for families. And then the other one is about the quality child care and learning environments, whether that's in home. So how do we equip parents to provide that rich stimulating environment as well as the child care. We, we have an, the same challenge all of you have with not enough child care seats, not enough affordability, and we will tackle that. And we didn't want to have that consume all of our attention and all of our resources. So we, we're, we're pretty um, committed to this holistic kind of approach. Um, we want to include parents in guiding our work. We're in the process of, of uh, figuring out how do we build out a parent advisory council or, or what, whatever we end up calling that so that we can test our own assumptions and our own approaches with families. Um, I, I, uh, our community foundation here is committed to a decade of work, at least in this effort. and. We hope to um, significantly contribute financially, but also from a leadership role and keep our attention on this. And we know that policy is an important part of this, uh, both at the state level where our state just gave significant increases for vouchers that school vouchers that can be used for private schools. So parent families with incomes of over 200,000 have now access to vouchers. And in our state to get a preschool voucher, you have to be living really poorly. Um, and if you make a little bit of money, you lose that voucher for preschool. So it, it's problematic. And if I would have one challenge to issue to the feds, it would be to change the federal poverty level. Because when I look at what the numbers are on the federal poverty level chart, they're less than half of what a living wage is for a family of four. And I think so much of our state funding and, and even federal funding gets tied to that federal poverty level. If there's some way we can make that more realistic, it might help us all. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Candy. I'm curious in that holistic approach, do you have any formal or informal connections to the public schools or, or private schools in your community? 
Yes, we actually, we're fortunate that we have a, a nonprofit organization that for 10 years has been convening all of the seven public school systems for some career pathway kind of work. And that has created this nice collaboration among the school systems. We have some connections as well with the private schools. There is a real interest in bridging the, the gap in understanding from the preschool teachers world to the kindergarten teachers world. And that's one of the, um, the initial steps I hope we're gonna be able to pull off here before long where there's conversations and probably round table uh, format is the way we'll do that. We've done that in some other areas in the county and they appreciate the opportunities to learn from each other. And um, so that's probably the approach we'll take. Swati, so comment on that? It's, it's great to hear about the sort of cross-sector professional learning because um, I think it's obvious why, that there's a pretty big chasm or gorge between these systems and absent relationships, you can't really work on these other sorts of issues. And I think that's so local. So, you know, we've seen lots of examples over the years where um, school districts are um, working with and inviting the early care and education providers to be around a table talking about transitions and shared data and shared work. And so, but a relationship is the, the beginning. And so I um, appreciate that approach and um, appreciate, you know, thinking um, with all of you about how that um, gorge or chasm could be facilitated with, you know, starting with this kind of steps, Candy, that you're talking about. Thank you. Um, Jesse Gunn, I, I, I wanted to come to you. Jesse, are you um, on the call? I, I think you are. Well, um, Candy brought up the poverty, the poverty level. Um, that that's not a new issue for this field, um, especially uh, at a time when we're looking at children's savings accounts and children's trust accounts and universal basic income, trying to trying to build assets among our poor and low income families uh, and not pushing them off the benefits cliff. Um, I, I, I think I, I think we have to look to you, Swati. It's like, you know, that's uh, you know, we're trying to build strong families and then we push them off this benefits cliff. And uh, it, it kind of like. Uh, we know the poverty level makes no sense anymore, but I don't know why we don't get more traction on that issue. Well, uh, you know, obviously, if we could magically change that, um, there have been, as you referenced, there have been lots of conversations and um, other sorts of measurements to try and make that case. Um, but I do think it's... Um, you know, the, well, unfortunately, the Department of Education doesn't oversee setting that um, standard, but I can definitely bring that um, feedback back. I, um, I, uh, Terry, Terry Sparks put something in the chat. Terry, I wonder if you would talk a little bit more about that. Um, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Terry Sparks from the DeKalb County Community Foundation, and we are located in Northern Illinois. Um, in a little town of Sycamore, um, and we serve the Cal County. And so um, as part of one of our initiatives as from the community, community foundation standpoint, um, kindergarten readiness has been one for quite some time. And um, so we have a co collaborative for young children that consists of many of, of our par partner organizations like the Regional Office of Education, who is our backbone organization, um, as well as um, some social service organizations that serve our families, um, home visiting um, services that um, contribute to the conversation as well. But what I put in the chat was um, years ago, we as a community foundation and with our partners of the collaborative um, sought out a program called the Boston Basics, which was founded out of Harvard University. Um, and uh, since then, we have been able to kind of use that and, and brand ourselves as Basics to Cal County. 
um, which has been in place since 2019, where we hired a um, coordinator for the county. And since then, it's really taken off um, and been embraced by our, our collaborative and our county and our service providers. And so um, it is kind of a holistic approach and who are our community partners um, and who are the people that are talking to our families and about engaging their children and how we parent and prepare our children and prepare our parents to be a child's first teacher. Um, and so with that model, it really focuses on zero to three as 80% of brain development happens from zero to three. Um, and so from there, we've engaged with, there's a texting app or, you know, a texting service where you can sign up for texts and get, you know, what today's basic is and a, you know, an example of how you can use it with your child or grandchild. Or, um, so we have a texting service, we have newsletters, um, but I sent the um, link to the website there, but also it's being picked up at a statewide level now. So there's a couple, Rockford, Illinois, Aurora, Illinois also um, have an iteration of this program, but it is now becoming basic to Illinois. Um, and so um, DeKalb County has been kind of selected as one of those leaders to help lead the initiative statewide. So we're really proud of that. And there's, of course, room to grow. And we face the same challenges as all of you as well. But that was a highlight and something I just wanted to stand up um, because it's been really great for our community and hopefully we'll continue to Terry, is there public funding for that program in Illinois? Um, no, we've re not at this point that I know of, but I can speak from our county level is this was an, a grant from our community foundation. And then that has been leveraged to receive other grants like from the McCormick Foundation um, and numerous others that have been able to kind of um, provide continuing support. The challenge, however, I'm sure all of you face this too, is that a lot of grant support is annual and not sustainable. And so um, when you're talking about program support, longevity of grant dollars over a number of years is much more um, useful for the sustainability portion of that. So um, that's something we're really looking for too is to get some multi-year grant funding. Great, thank you. And I see in the chat, Jane Conover's brought up the first 10, which Swati also commented on. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, I'm sorry, I missed the beginning, but, and, and Swati's remarks, I just wanted to mention, I'm with Jane Conover with the York County Community Foundation in York, Pennsylvania. And we have funded multiple years of the first 10 initiative in York, um, which is linking, as you probably know, uh, the city school district in York with um, early learning for early educators. Uh, and it's been very successful. I, they're linked with the national effort. Um, it was based on that model. And um, I say it's been successful. I was just sort of quickly reading the, the grant report, but um, basically it served about 1,100 families helping them, helping bring the kid, the early learners into the school system, uh, having play, to parents participate, uh, playing and learning. And um, they, there's, there's, it's going to be ongoing. It's a basically now a kind of a collaboration that is formal. There's a formal advisory group, um, but I think again, if they needed additional resources, we might we would be interested in that. Um, so again, successful. One other thing I didn't put in the chat, but I will mention to you is that, uh, like all of you, you're seeing a real. We're seeing in your county a real challenge identifying and securing and retaining early educators. So what we did with uh, several other foundations in the community is we created a pool of funds and established the Early Educator Awards Program. Uh, it really was modeled after a statewide program that was discontinued. Uh, and so uh, we have a pool and we, again, we're, we're providing teachers and staff with a bonus uh, based on their education level and their star level, uh, the quality programming in our community. And, and um, last year we gave away about $650,000 to about 311 teachers or educators across the county. We've asked our funders um, to, who is continuing to grow the pool. A lot of more employers are putting money into it because they see the need for their, their employees to be able to get quality childcare. So we have now uh, about five years of funding in place for that. 
But I think the long-term game, as we know, is to try and uh, to change some policies so that uh, either minimum wage goes up or and or that that early learning becomes more integrated into the federal and federal budget so that teachers and child care centers have the money they need to pay the competitive wages. Thank you. Thank you. More audience participation. I, I was struck by the comment earlier that um, when we started the Peninsula Partnership in 1998, uh, the first thing we asked was, how do kindergarten teachers assess kindergarten readiness? Um, I still don't know that there is an accepted tool out there for uh, assessment of five-year-olds when they when they show up perhaps with no child care, formal child care experience or pre-K experience. Um, but it was amazing the controversy we caused when we just asked that question. Um, I remember some people, even principals ran away in horror, like I would never want my teachers to do that. They would sort the kids and track them from there on out. And of course, that obviously is not the point of, of an assessment of a five-year-old. I also wish we could give parents of two-year-olds and three-year-olds, like here is the kindergarten readiness assessment tool. Uh, if you wanna get your kid ready for that, how can we help you, you know, shoot for that? It's like, we don't have to worry about high school graduation yet. We just have to worry about these basics. But um, I know that would take a whole nother set of infrastructure supports. Swati, you wanna talk about first 10 or other issues? Um, Sterling, I'll just go back to the point that was raised about the strains on the workforce right now, because I just think um, that's so key and pivotal to this, uh, really a crisis of where we are. Um, of course, we all wish, uh, and I shouldn't say we, but there was a lot of energy that went into Build Back Better. It was before I arrived at the department that really attended to many of these issues. As you know, that didn't pass. But I think it's really important for folks to know that this is an issue that's really important to this administration. There was recently an executive order just um, issued attending to this, um, looking at the Department of Labor, um, Health and Human Services, and the Department of Education all leaning in with looking at different strategies that are um, that can be deployed within our current purview. And so, you know, I. Um, we can send a link to that if you haven't taken a look at it, but it does focus a lot on child care in the workforce. The um, Health and Human Services did set up a new workforce technical assistance center specifically focus on how we can look at retention and supporting wages. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, but um, the other thing I was going to say is in the fiscal year 2024 um, Budget, the Department of Education has a proposed discretionary uh, preschool grant to uh, build on some of the points I made earlier of encouraging school districts to engage um, in expanding preschool. And for those um, districts that use Title I, you have to uh, build in the Head Start performance standards. So partnership with Head Start is a key part of this, including equitable wages. So there's a provision in there that attends to wages. So I, you know, there's um, the secretary um, is very strong on this issue of um, equitable and fair compensation for educators and the ways we've got to pay far greater attention to making sure we retain and provide the set of supports um, that we're seeing educators need, um, particularly on the heels of the pandemic um, and compensation is a key part of it. So I do wanna underscore that while the answers aren't all there, the um, leadership commitment messaging and the tools currently available to the um, federal agencies are really being lifted up. Can I just clarify that was uh, uh, you mentioned the discretionary grant program? It was in it's in the budget, but it hasn't been passed yet. Right, it's in the fiscal year twenty four budget. But I think um, you know the design and crafting of it, and I think you know policy, of course, um, is not instant soup, and you have to look for those opportunity moments, but. From um, where we sit at the department, having that intentionality that there are no silver bullets, it's not a preschool standalone, it embraces work with Head Starts and community-based partners, it's embracing the mixed delivery system, 
and really echoing um, the need for that continuity. So I think the more we can think about these systems and think about the sturdy bridge, as I said, and, and figure out how folks on the ground can start to forge those relationships. So some of these strategies can evolve more naturally because you're sort of realizing you're getting your arms around the same kids. It's like a parent's not saying, oh, I'm just a parent, birth to five. And you know, it turns out I don't have to worry about kindergarten. So how we really center the needs of children and families. I'm just mindful in all the different roles that I've been in how many hurdles and barriers um, there are that kind of make us think about just our very narrow role in boxes and that really we're going to have to broaden what we see as our lane if we're really going to think about that sort of seamless experience. And I think, you know, some of the things that you all have mentioned point to that. There's no question that just starting in kindergarten is a sufficient answer. And we know many of the things you all have been saying about the you know, key brain development and parent supports. I mean, I think if the, during the pandemic, if we learned anything, we learned about the critical role of parents as partners, um, not just in the birth to five years, but in the early elementary years and the NAEP scores really underscored um, the early literacy and the early math supports that have got to be aligned. And so, I just um, would love to continue conversation with all of you to think about what would be the um, supports or starting points to create the building of the relationships that would support parents navigating what is a really difficult thing for parents who get fully, let's say you have that support in birth to five, it's intimidating to suddenly arrive at a school setting. And if English isn't your first language, or you're concerned about some issues with your child, how would you navigate that conversation? Who do you go to? How does that, um, how do you know that you can have those sets of supports? Schools aren't necessarily set up that way. And I think how those expectations get set are far more people who are grounded in the science of child development being a robust part of the conversation with our K-12 partners. Thank you, wow. Um, uh, Jesse Dunn, Executive Director from Whidbey Community Foundation. Uh, I have on my list, list here that you house the Dolly Parton Imagination Library at your community foundation. Could you talk a little bit more about that, Jesse? I can see her picture there, but um, well, I was curious. I mean, uh, my good friend Ralph Smith started the campaign for grade level reading. Um, you know, there have been so many great webinars on that platform over the last several years. Um, I'm always interested in the book programs people host or sponsor. Uh, Ginger Young has Book Harvest in Durham, North Carolina. There are so many books, book programs. Uh, Jeff Bezos gave Dolly Parton $100 million. And I'm dying to find out how Dolly is going to spend that money. Um, and I worry, I worry that but we know how to get books into, into children's homes, but do we know how to get them to be actually shared by the adults and the caregivers in those homes? So I, I, I wanted my colleagues at Raising a Reader to ask Dolly for a couple million dollars because our families love it when Dolly's books arrive. But if the parents don't, aren't as excited as the kids about actually sharing them, um, I just worry that books are not our problem. It's, it's, it's shared reading routines. Um, it looks like... Uh, is that, um, pay, uh, I'm sorry, Miriam? Oh, Miriam, you got your hand up? Not intentionally, sorry. <laughs> comments, comments on book programs that you're sponsoring or hosting and their, their effectiveness. Um, I, uh, we, we, we got second place uh, to fa uh, the Fast Company Social Entrepreneur Awards one year, Raising a Reader got second place to first book. And I, I just asked them, I said, what, what's the data? I mean, we're, we're, we care about outcomes, not inputs. Um, 
if it's a lack of books in our in our communities, we can drop them out of helicopters. It's kind of a very third world image. You know, kids are just hungry for books. Just drop them out of the helicopters and they'll start reading. Um, and obviously, we know that's not how families who are not used to reading or sharing books uh, typically um, acquire that habit. Um, and and so, of course, they. I said, what are the outcomes? And we love first book. I love all the book programs. But they said the uh, the measure for for that was you just have to see the look on a kid, child's eyes when they get their first book. And I thought, well, I don't know that that's the data that's going to get our 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 infants, toddlers and preschoolers walking into kindergarten, you know, in love with books um, and ready to learn to read because they love books and pictures. Any comments on that? Oh, Kristen. Yeah. Um... We, uh, I'm with the Heritage Fund Wars, uh, Community Foundation in Southern Indiana. Um, we recently piloted a program, a, a book program um, in partnership with our local library and our pediatricians. Um, so the goal was to get books in the hands of kids at, um, at well child visits, which statistically um, we were seeing that that the the uh, most of our kids were attending those visits, but it was more um, more so than just getting the books in their hands, but utilizing the pediatricians to model um, literacy behavior to parents. So what we found from um, surveying parents was that you know those pediatricians were already a trusted source um, for information. They're focused on developmental milestones. Um, so we thought that was a more effective use of funding. Um, we also saw that you know, uh, families in our communities, especially the underserved, um, you know, were somewhat transient. So a book program that mails to the home, not um, super effective. Um, also, the parents had to opt into that program. And it was really missing the, the literacy education piece, um, which we found um, that our pediatricians were really happy to partner with and provide. Um, and it's opened some doors to some additional partnerships, we think, um, because again, the pediatricians have this captive audience. Um, you know, are there other resources that we can connect these parents through um, through that pathway. Um, so we're still in the pilot stages of that and, and working on how we're gonna, um, to your point, uh, Sterling measure success and, and outcomes beyond uh, kids look, look happy with books. And Kristen, was that Reach Out and Read, the program with pediatricians? It's not, uh, it's it's modeled loosely after that, but we decided to um, to do it locally um, so that we would have a little bit more um, control. We also, some of our pediatricians had some familiarity with that program and found it a little burdensome. Um, so we're actually delivering books to their office um, and, and oh. also um, able, if we can control it locally, we can also um, help um, guide some of the local resources to those families as well, instead of depending on a national program. Ah, that's fantastic. Local adaptation. I know our colleagues at Too Small to Fail are trying to get reading reading environments into waiting rooms at social services agencies, laundromats. Uh, I, 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 I love trying to make more places reading friendly, but you still have to walk in. It's like putting a gym in every corner. You still want to exercise, right? Miriam, you now have your hand up. I do. I didn't have it up before, but I do have it now. And you're going just uh, where I was going to go, um, which is um, in addition to all the really clever ways of getting books into the hands of kids in their homes and hopefully having them read, I've been really impressed with a number of the efforts that are just putting literacy activities and numeracy activities like in the paths of families as they go about their daily business. So Playful learning landscapes, kaboom, uh, some libraries, uh, children's museums, and so forth. I just love some of the things that they're doing, just setting up um, interactive um, activities just at bus stops and waiting rooms and, um, in as you mentioned, in laundromats, just putting um, um, uh, really attractive engagement opportunities where families are in the course of their day, just kind of surround sound. Um, so I just thought I'd add that. Thank you, Roy, Roy Williams. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Roy Williams from the Greater New Orleans Foundation. This isn't something that we are funding, but it's actually being done by a private interest. So we have a restaurant group here who's really invested in literacy. So there's a restaurant, a laundromat, and a number of other things all connected. 
but it's all built around literacy. So there are books everywhere. So as you know, families are coming in to do laundry, kids can access a book. If um, if the parents buy a book, you know, they may get a free sandwich or a free drink, right? So it's these incentives that are really allowing for families to, like you said, go go about their day-to-day business, but encouraging reading. Um, you know, you know, here in New Orleans, uh, alcohol is kind of a an everywhere thing. So if a parent can buy a book and get a free daiquiri, it's an amazing connection that allows families to really do what they're going to do. And, you know, it's been, I'm not sure about the, um, the efficacy of, of the program, but we do, you know, we do know that this is something that families are accessing. So it's definitely great to see. Oh, thank you. Allison. Hi, uh, sorry for my screen being off. Allison Gerardo from the Community Foundation of Greater Fort Wayne in Northern Indiana. Um, we have a fund that was actually started by an individual, a couple that is just very passionate about literacy and getting children's brain development on track. And so they um, created a fund called the Book Start Fund, which partners with 16 different organizations and the requirement to be able to get books is for case managers to go out when they go out into the homes, they get books and then they have to engage with the parents on how to um, use the books with their children. So how to read to them, how to engage them, how to show them pictures. Um, and so she's uh, drummed up enough that she has now 16 organizations she's partnered with and she personally raises money every year. Um, she's on the path to raise an endowment to sustain this for the long term um, to continue to just buy books on an annual basis and then make sure those get into case managers hands to then teach the parents how to read to their children. Ah. That's great. That And so you've just built that from the ground up based on those donors wanting to underwrite it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they they have really taken the lead on it. And we, uh, as we have become, we're sort of coming at the uh, behind them in our interest of early childhood education. And so, uh, you know, we're celebrating the work they have already done and then looking to support that as we move forward. Well, thank you. I know we're getting close to time. Uh, are there any other questions or ideas? I, I love the idea of people in your community, Allison, when you go in for that three-year-old well-child visit, the pediatrician is going to hand the parent a book and saying, okay, let me see you read to your kid. And then you discover like, yeah, we, we do this all the time. Or like, hmm, uh, yeah, haven't been exercising as much as I was supposed to. So Swati, any closing comments? No, just a real appreciation for the chance to be with all of you and hoping we can engage you in the Bright Spots campaign as it gets going. Well, we thank you for your, your willingness to share time with our colleagues. And I'm, I'm guessing this is just the tip of the iceberg with all these practitioners and advocates on early childhood. I hope we can continue to support this community. Pam, oh, your Pam's clapping, not holding her hand up. Okay. Um, I want to thank my colleagues, Rachel Reese and Melody McLean for organizing this webinar, and we will keep all of your names on our list as we continue to build the catalog of um, best practices and colleagues doing this work, um, and we'll look forward to, to working with you in the days ahead. Swati, Adhikar, thank you again so much for being our guest expert, um, and, and we wish you success with this administration. Thank you so much, Sterling. Really appreciate it. Best to all of you.